Hare Krishna, Guru Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Thank you, Chaitanya Charanji. As always, I enjoy being here with you. Yes, bro. I enjoy it much, much more. And I, many devotees also tell me how much they relish these discussions. Wonderful. So, I thought today we would discuss the topic on which probably you have specialized more than more than most, or I would say any other devotee in our movement, in terms of definitely the academic uh, domain as well as the devotional presentation. So the the Rasa Lila, the Ras Panchadhyay, and the Ras Lila in general. So I thought of discussing it in broadly three parts. First is that the why is the Ras Lila so important? Second is that why is there so much uh, fear or apprehension in discussing the Ras Lila? Mm. And then what would be the way in which we can appreciate and relish it? Mm. Yes. So superb. Now just to start this. the the imagery in you know, iconography that we see about krishna leela so there are two three iconog- iconographic images which are very common one is krishna speaking the bhagavad gita to arjuna another is krishna stealing butter and you could say in general krishna's childhood past times krishna stealing butter or krishna dancing on kaliya right. but one of the most common iconographies is that krishna performing the ras leela precisely yeah and uh, that indicates broadly speaking the you could the the popularity the influence the in uh, the the importance that this has not just in the gaudiya vaishnava tradition but broadly in the broad you could say indian hindu vedic whatever word you want to use in the tradition so krishna has performed many past times uh, now at one level we can say this is the madhureras past time so it's important but uh, can you explain how or why this pastime is has become so important in the broad culture and the tradition yes well <clears throat> a very rich topic the the fact of the matter is that every devotee in every temple worships the ras leela either consciously or unconsciously deliberately or not deliberately when we gaze upon the divine figures of radha and krishna the ras mandala okay the uh, the the sort of um, iconographic imagery you were referring to in your opening statement there are of course many scenes i've counted 13 different scenes oh. in the ras the five chapters uh, uh, rasa panchadhyaya means for those who don't know it means the five chapters pancha five adhyaya chapters the five chapters of the of the uh, rasa uh, the rasa dance the well known uh, uh, sort of word rasa now rasa at the same time is not the same as rasa for those again just for the benefit of our listeners mm-hmm. the word rasa is a generic term meaning that various relationships one can have with god but rasa long first a rasa is different than rasa rasa refers to specifically the rasa dance uh, krishna's dance with the rajagopikas it also is defined by vishwanath the chakravarti as the the uh, uh the, the the rasa of all rasas which would be rasa so the ultimate display of rasa is the rasa so okay. already even in understanding the nature of the word rasa one can see why it's so important we in some sense celebrate a kind of distillation of all rasa uh, uh, sort of uh, experience in the rasa and of all of the uh, iconographic imagery of the ras leela and like i said i've analyzed 13 different scenes the one scene uh that really stands out the anti penultimate scene third to last scene is the scene in which krishna is dancing in the circle dance of the rasa and it's the ras mandala the ras mandala let me see do i have here yes i have here the ras mandala 
me see, let me take it out of the cellophane. It's too shiny. But the Ras Mandala. This is a painting that I had commissioned by a devotee, a Rajasthani devotee, who oh, okay. painted it according to my specifications. Because many artists put into the Ras Mandala painting a lot of things that are not mentioned in the text. So mine is very much to the text. That was the idea. Okay, well, we'll get back to that later. Um, your question was, um, why is the Ras Lila so important? Was that it? Uh, yes, so why is it so important Okay. in general? Okay, so the Ras Lila, the, 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 the five chapters in the Bhagavata Purana, 10th canto, you know, Dashama Skanda, uh, chapters 29 through 33, those five chapters are the pinnacle of the whole Bhagavata Purana. Every chapter, every canto prior to that leads up to this summit of the Rasa Pachadhyayi and everything after it refers back to it in some sense. So the Bhagavata is like a mountain that we climb and we finally get to the Rasa Pachadhyayi. It is the it is the, as, as Vishwanatha Chakravarti says, it is the Sarva Leela Chudamani, the crown jewel of all Leelas. As Krishnadas Kaviraj says, it is the Leela Sara, the essence of all Leelas. Okay. So, so when you say it refers back or forward, are you meaning that... Uh... Say in the first canto, I know in the Bhishma pastime there is a reference to Ras Lila. Are you saying in that sense there is a back and forth reference, or uh, there's, a, there's a subtle thread of anticipating the Rasa Panchadhyayi, and then there's a subtle thread following it that looks back toward it. It's subtle. Okay. Okay. But but you see, this is one of the questions that came up in my my research. May, may I tell you how I came to study the Rasa Panchadhyayi at all? Yes, so that is, I think, a very good context. Because, I mean, anyone who goes to the Rasa Panchadhyayi and writes a book on it, as yeah. I have. You know, maybe what we could do is we could invert the sequence before we talk about the importance. Maybe we need to take a talk about the apprehension because that's what comes up for most devotees first. That, you know, maybe well, we should, you know what, should be studying all of, this. All of these things are going to be combined. When, yes, when you hear my story. So, okay. I mean, <clears throat> first of all, back in the day, when, um, okay, I mean, my gosh. Okay, so here I am, the first devotee to enter into the academic world to become an expert on our tradition. Hmm. As you know, Chaitanya Charanji, Prabhupada loved the scholarly endorsements of his work. Yes. He absolutely loved that. So, so here was I to um, uh, enter into the academic arena and be one of them while being one of us at the same time. Okay. And this was in the age of establishing the Bhaktivedanta Institute. Okay, so the Bhaktivedanta Institute was, of course, focusing on science primarily, but it was also uh, to, you know, move into the humanities as well. Um, so let me see here. I was going to read here. Uh, Did Prabhupada specifically talk about humanities or? Because in general, humanities is not a very developed field in India as such. That's right. So, so, so he was mostly, he was fixed on science. You know, that, that life comes from life, you know, not yes. matter. And this distinction, this very heavy Sankhya, very Sankhya-esque, you know, um, uh, uh, distinction between Purusha 
and prakriti. Okay. But then again, in our temples, we are worshiping the Purushottama. And the Purushottama, you know, the, the ultimate Purushottama, the ultimate Leela of Purushottama. So, so you know, the, how to bring these two things together uh, was a, you know, a tricky kind of uh, enterprise. Hmm. So, so, so when um, I entered back into graduate school and Prabhupada read my first thesis, master's thesis, on the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I was criticizing the criticism of Krishnas Kaviraj. I was trying to show the academic community the extraordinary work of Krishnas Kaviraj Goswami. Hmm. So Prabhupada read my, my thesis uh, in his uh, few months before departing this world. And uh, he um, also heard from Rupanuga Prabhu at the time, the last of 101 letters that Rupanuga would write to Prabhupada, for which he received 100 letters of response. The last letter he wrote had the last paragraph that contained all about what I was doing on my way to Harvard. And he says, we have been planning his program in order to get him into Harvard, where he can make a name for our society. Uh, let's see, skip a line here. Our uh, Here's the key line, Chaitanya Charanji. Our idea is to establish the pure theism of Lord Chaitanya at Harvard, vanquishing the Christian monopoly on theology. There you go. Beautifully put, huh? Okay. Very, uh, Rupa Nuna had a way with words. So then he says, um, uh, generously, Garuda is a very good scholar and a perfect gentleman. I think maybe back then I was a perfect gentleman. I haven't really, I don't have any evidence of that now. And he will make good impression in the intellectual community. Okay. These were the last words that Prabhupada ever heard from Rupanuga Prabhu, one of his earliest disciples. Oh, okay. So, um, Tamal Krishna Goswami wrote back saying, after hearing your whole report, your package has really made his divine grace enthusiastic. So, so this was my mission to go into the intellectual community at the top level, University of Chicago and Harvard. University of Chicago is where Edward Dimock uh, 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 taught, and he was, he was the one who wrote the foreword that Prabhupada so appreciated. So I went there, but then I went on to Harvard. So, so as I'm collecting degrees, three master's degrees, I, I warned you, uh, I'm an overeducated idiot, really, okay? Three master's degrees. Who I don't even know anyone who has three master's degrees. It's ridiculous, okay? But I did one at University of Chicago and two at Harvard. And then I entered the doctoral program at Harvard. And as anyone listening here knows, you have to, at the end of your doctorate, you have to write a book. You have to write an original contribution to knowledge. You have to make an original contribution to knowledge. You have to mm. speak about something. You have to illuminate something further that the world's never heard before. Mm. So I was to do originally for years, it was understood that I was to do a comparative study between Christianity and Krishna Bhakti. This was understood for years. In fact, that's how I applied to Harvard doctoral program. I said I would do a dissertation on this kind of comparative study. Why? Because Prabhupada spoke about the importance of a comparative study. Um, um, Prabhupada wrote in a letter to Giriraj back in, the, in 1969, um, I like the idea that you, can, that you should make a thorough study of theological schools and in the future, if you can explain our Krishna consciousness movement as the postgraduate presentation of all theological theses, then it will be a great accomplishment. 
Hmm. Wow. So you see how these words kind of converge on my being, <laughs> right? Okay. The pressure to do this, right? Cool. Okay. So I'm sitting before my doctoral dissertation advisor in his office. And he said, you know, he said, I have complete faith that there's plenty of scholarly treatment on the Christian side. I don't have faith that there's enough scholarly treatment on the Krishna Bhakti side. I said, hmm. He said, tell me. And then he confronted me. And maybe this is Krishna working through him. He said, Graham, which is my legal first name. He said, Graham, what is the highest vision of the Chaitanya school? Can you imagine being asked this? Here, what is the highest vision of the Chaitanya school? Now, here's my Harvard professor, world famous guy, mm. who's asking me, what is the highest vision? So I'm sitting there like, I'm, I'm at, at absolutely nanosecond speed, you know, going through all of the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavata, Rasamrita, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the, the, the Chaitanya Charta. I'm going through everything that I've read. And I've been studying Prabhupada's books for years at this point and going deeply into them, hanging on to every word because of my going into the academic realm. So I need to hang on to my spiritual master's words. So he's confronting me. What is the highest vision? I sat back and I came out. I said, well, it would have to be the Rasa Pachidyai. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would hear the verses read by Swarup Damodar, his personal secretary. And this was the only thing that would send him into ecstasy. Rehearing these verses. It was the ultimate vision. And so he said, okay, well, has there been scholarly treatment of that? I say, well, many scholars speak about it and refer to it. I'm sure that there is. He said, show me. So for a month, I scoured the libraries at Harvard University, the largest library system of any university in the world. And I came back with zero. Oh. I came back and I said, Professor Carmen, there is none. He said, that is your dissertation. I said, whoa. What will my God brothers and God, God sisters say? Hey, guess what? I'm going to be writing a dissertation on, you know, the highest vision of our philosophy, the stuff that Prabhupada says you don't jump to, you know, the stuff that Prabhupada says is the most advanced vision for the most advanced devotees. I mean, I was basically completely like disturbed that I would have to do. That. How was I going to explain to my God brothers in 1990? Hmm. You know, <laughs> how was I going to justify it? So I, I talked with various uh, God brothers and God sisters of mine uh, in whom I could have some trust and so on. Basically, all of them said, it looks like you're going to have to do it. I was trying to think of some way to get out a bit, Chaitanya Charan. Frankly, because the pressure of treating such a sacred, sacred Leela was a lot of pressure. And then the criticism, oh, Garuda the Sahajya, Oh, Garuda, oh, Garuda's dancing with the gopis somewhere, you know, uh, Garuda's, you know, Garuda's, uh, you know, uh, a, a cheap, you know, a cheap shot or whatever. But anyway, I had to put all of that behind me and say, look, somehow Krishna's arranged for me to have to write my doctoral dissertation on the Rasa Panchadyai. So I did. So here, it's almost ironic that in expounding on our own tradition, your greatest apprehension came from within the tradition itself. Yes. So, 
Yes. That is something which we need to really understand. Uh, Chitanya Karanji, a leading, leading devotee in the movement. Very hmm. influential. I won't mention his name. Literally said, we should not read the five chapters on the Raslila. This is the stuff that was going on back then. No one should read the Ras Lila. Now, of course, let me remind you and others listening that Prabhupada gave us the Krishna books. Yes, it's almost ironic. You know, Prabhupada was very cautious about reading the Ras Lila, but he doesn't. Re- we, could, we could say he doesn't edit or censor the uh, the Rasa Panchadhyay chapters when he's describing in the in his no. summary study. That's right. So, but in that chapter, by the way. Uh, and the chapters devoted to the Ras Lila in Krishna book, there are four chapters, not five, okay? So there are four chapters. So there's a little condensing. And Prabhupada weaves his narrative, his cautionary narrative throughout. He said, do not take this cheaply. Do not think this is, that these are ordinary boys and girls dancing. Hmm. Do not, and, and he warned that this is, this takes the most matured and elevated level of Krishna Bhakti to fully appreciate what's going on here. So, Prabhu, I understand this point, but this raises yeah. one straightforward um, one question which I've never really got a very good answer to. That is it, say, the Gita Govinda was at one time very popular. You know, it was like what we would call a bestseller. At yes. a super hit or a bestseller at one particular point. Yes. And then Krishna Leela, I mean the gopis' pastimes have been widely depicted. Krishna stealing the clothes of the gopis or Krishna dancing with the gopis. So now this has been a long part of the tradition. So were everybody who were hearing these pastimes or watching these uh, depictions, were all of them pure devotees? What was the way the Ras Leela was understood in the past? I know especially... I think at the time of Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Bhaktivinoda Sri Thakur, there was the mixing of the Tantra with the Bhakti. And that yeah. led to a lot of uh, a lot of misapplication. Yes. But in, but, but in one sense, it's the, the romantic or even the erotic aspect is very much there in that pastime. So how yes. was it seen in the past? That, that is the apprehension right now. But I don't see the, the way Prabhupada used cautionary statements. We don't see in uh, in Anand Rindavan Champu or even in Lalit Madhav, Vidagda Madhav, the Goswami's literature, they don't focus so much on giving such cautionary statements. Yes. So how was it understood in the past? In one sense, the misunderstanding seems to be the natural result of reading something like this. Yes, okay. I can speculate a little bit here. When Prabhupada, it, you know, Prabhupada was raised in Bengal, he was in the hotbed of tantric and sahajya uh, practices of Krishna Bhakti, right? There was all around them, all around him at the time. And this was, of course, in, in, you know, very um, uh, abrasive to Prabhupada, because this was not the pure orthodox practice. It was a shadow practice. It was a cheap practice. It was an imitation. Okay. And it got pretty degraded. Then, okay, so then Prabhupada follows the order of his spiritual master at age 70, comes over to the United States, and what's going on there? Free sex, free this, free, you know, hippie, you know, culture. So my gosh, he went from one Sahajya culture to another Sahajya culture. That's interesting. You're using the word, <laughs> you're using the word Sahajya in what sense? It, well, okay. You know, the word Sahajya, you know, the word Sahaja means natural. So Sahajya is one who's practicing the sort of natural or you could even say mundane. So it's, an, it's a mundane uh, practice of of uh, the 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 uh, or appreciation of the rasa panchajai, so that means that all women are you know uh, gopis and all men are krishnas and and they dance together and they're in some sense reenacting. But no, 
It doesn't work that way. Um, that's cheap. That's cheapening the whole rasa panchidai. And then they take it as something sexual and mundane. And, and, um, uh, and, and it becomes an ugly depiction. And yet this is the most sacred dimension of our tradition. So in one sense, the devotees got it right. Just stay away from it until you're ready. Mm. But listen to the last and final verse of the Rasa Panchadyayi, which I'd like to read to you, my translation. This is the divine play of Vishnu with the fair maidens of Raja. One who is filled with faith who hears or describes this play, having regained the highest devotion for the beloved Lord, has lust, the disease of the heart, hridrogam, hridrogam, I believe is the phrase used here, the disease of the heart, hrid, right, hridrogam, has the disease of the heart quickly removed without delay. Such a person is peaceful and wise. So the idea is that, ironically, by reading this Leela from the Bhagavata Purana, you are released from lust, mm -hmm. from selfish egoism. You delight in the Lord's love. Too. So there's the irony. Stay away from the Ras Leela. Well, then how am I going to be purified? Well, obviously, the purificatory process of Krishna Bhakti is plenty to be purified by. I mean, we have so much good instruction from in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and from Prabhupada, our spiritual master's instructions, et cetera, et cetera, our Bhakti process. The holy names are, in one sense, all you need to be purified. Hmm. But, but, the Shravanam process includes hearing the Bhagavata, Bhagavata Seva. It's one of the five most important principles of Krishna Bhakti, in addition to the um, uh, recitation of the holy names. So in one sense, it's equally important. And what, where does the Bhagavata lead us and take us ultimately? To the Rasa Panchadyayi. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as so, rather, Chris, so the, the way you are putting it is that that while there are there are these cautions, there is also the emphasis that the Bhagavatam is also the cure for the Rasila itself is a cure for this also. Yes. So exactly. And but just as just as um uh home, just as um uh, uh, Ayurvedic medicine or homeopathic medicines can engage things that are apparently poisonous. You know, arsenic, belladonna, ugh, all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But just they can engage that to purify us from disease. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So this is, you know, quite an amazing thing. The, the Rasa Panchadyayi is the most dangerous thing and the most powerful thing for our purification. It can, mm -hmm. it can... You know the, the 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 wrong amount of arsenic or and belladonna or whatever, that, and I don't know much about uh, homeopathy or or Ayurveda or whatever. But the wrong amounts of the substances in the medicines meant to cure us can also kill us. Hmm. Reading the Rasa Panchadyayi at the wrong time from the wrong persons will kill your devotion. Okay. Reading it from the right teachers, with the right lens, with the prema netra, mm. with the eye of love, the bhakti valochana, with the eye of devotion, with the right teachers, with guru, and with, with good uh, sangha. This is the right way to look. To, to read it in light of the bhashyas, the great acharyas, and their bashas to read it with that lens, but especially the lens that Prabhupada himself gave us. Hmm. Then we're safe. You know what? Sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was just going to say yeah. that to shy away from the Ras Lila and all that is so beautiful and celebrative and ultimate in its vision is like a Christian shying away from Jesus on the cross, the crucifixion. That central, huh? Is that central? It's uh, Jesus on the cross is not particularly a pleasant image. That's but it right. Is, it is very central. Now, okay. It, now I've just I never thought of this particular comparison. Like if we see today's entertainment, there is sex and there is violence, and that's what sells the entertainment. So yes. we don't. So we could say both are products of Rajo and Tamoguna. Lot of sexuality and lot of. Uh, Excessive yes. violence. Yes. So, so in the sense, the passion of the pa Jesus, the passion of Christ, is, it's it's a it's violence over there. Yes. It's it's, it's quite uh, in the crucifixion is quite brutal. Oh, it's oh, it's 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 gruesome. But to Christians, yeah, to an outsider, it's Roman capital punishment of the most cruel kind. Hmm. But to a Christian, it is the symbol. Of divine love. It is the symbol of salvation. So the way it looks on the inside and the way it looks on the outside, a Christian must be cognizant. In the same way, we bhaktas must be cognizant of the way the Ras Mandala can look. Oh, look at Krishna. He's simply some kind of, you know, flirt to many women and to even married women. But that's not what it's about. That is not, again, from the outside, it can appear that way. So we bhaktas have to become expert in explaining the most precious symbol to us. Now, why is the Ras Mandala or the Ras Lila relevant to us at all? Well, first of all, people know about it on the outside. But second of all, the Ras Mandala is collapsed in the two figures of Radha and Krishna. Because our acharyas explain that the Raja Gopikas and the Great Circle Dance are each, each of them are embodiments of different emotions of Radha. So when you look at the mandala of Raja Gopikas, you're actually looking at Radha. And Krishna attending each one of the Raja Gopikas is Krishna loving Radha is his most beloved consort and partner. So we are we are a tradition that celebrates love. Mm. We celebrate the love between Radha and Krishna. So just uh, and, going back to sorry, sorry to interrupt you, yeah, going back yeah, to yeah. the point that that the inside and outside perspective. So sometimes yes. what happens is that uh, two things may happen that we, although we are officially insiders, we may still have an outsider perspective because of our impurities. Yes, beautiful. And the other is also that we may, or we may so get uh, apprehensive because of the outsider perspective that we may never even strive to acquire the insider perspective. I, I think the way you just put this, uh, Chaitanya Charanji, is brilliant. Mm, thank that you. is exactly right. That is, you nailed the problem. True. You know, uh, one of the most uh, leading temples here in India, they were doing the whole Bhagavatam. And at that time, uh, they, they became to ask Panchadya, and they said, you know, this is too exalted for us to discuss. And they there just completed go. all five chapters in one class. And they went, after that, it's verse by verse, purport by purport. So when I asked the organizers, I said, you know, he says, we are not qualified to discuss this. So I, in one sense, appreciated that humility. But then yes. I said that, you know, if you, this was, this was one of the most learned temples in India, I would say, the devotees are very learned. It says, if you are not going to explain, who is going to explain? <laughs> right. You know, we may have that reserve, but there are people who are going to read it, watch it, have questions about it whether it is in TV or in books. And if we just have the answer, oh, this is so pure and so exalted, this cannot be, this should not be seen in a mundane way. 
well but okay don't see it in the mundane way that is okay then how to see it there has to be you could say at some level uh saying that it is transcendental does not uh, free us from the intellectual responsibility to explain how it is transcendental right mm -hmm. so i would say that so i think that is what your book has done in a very remarkable way eventually and you uh, were coming up to that book so so going back to you, the question i am not sure whether i got the answer to that question i said that do you have any idea how the raslila was seen in the tradition in india when the geet govind was written or because say, the society was quite conservative uh, in your book i think in the raslila chat the book raslila book itself in, in the introduction is it by the for, the, the foreword is by edwin bryant or who has written the foreword no the foreword was written by a professor at Yale University who was really the grandfather at the time of the field that I'm in in fact he was my harvard professor's doctoral mentor at yale so i think so he, he made he was yeah. my param guru oh. in the academic setting so i remember i think in in his introduction he says and you elaborate that in the book that that although this uh, this uh, this past time or this particular narrative seems to be filled with uh, uh, sexual licentiousness or something like that it is remarkable that it has not fostered sexual licentiousness among its followers so right. now i would say that maybe that was that is true for the broader tradition not specifically with the sahajias right so it seems maybe the conservative nature of indian society recognize that this is something to be worshiped but not to be imitated right but then when yes. some people started imitating it that's when the alarm started coming that's right that's exactly right and now you know if prabhupad um succumbed to this extreme caution he would have written the krishna book up to the rasa panchajai and said uh you know maybe wrote one paragraph saying what it was about and then saying but this is for this will be saved uh for uh fear of of uh, criticism so we'll skip over the five chapters but he didn't do that hmm. he actually gave the narration and he also wanted before. the krishna book to be widely distributed so it's, and it was and it was and it was indeed yeah they used to send me out with krishna books you know i was a, i was not a very good book distributor yeah i think your way of distributing books is to inspire people to study those books through courses uh, yeah yeah and i i speak to them way too long i i i i'm not a good salesman i i uh, i sit down with people for you know several hours and and talk to them about the content yeah, i remember you mentioned that in one of the earlier podcasts that's right exactly so that's why i ended up in the university that's where you can do that <laughs> true so two things uh since our discussion so insider outsider perspectives so you said prabhupad didn't succumb to that op that particular extra uh, like overzealousness over uh, to extreme caution uh, right. he gave the bhagavatam so now from what i know that uh, so when you talk about sahajya and tantra sahajya you mean you said it's natural so that was sahajya and the translation i had usually heard is cheap that taking something too easily or cheaply that's right so so can West, so so sahajyaism isn't it something which is based in scripture but distorted whereas say yeah. western when prabhupad went to the west to the hippies there the free sex didn't really have anything to do with scripture so yes, maybe sir. in behavior it is similar but in you could say the justification or the rationalization for it that they are quite different isn't it yes of course but at the same time it's it it must have impacted prabhupads yes definitely uh you know some some level of of hesitation and and the way prabhupad also said you know even our radha krishna worship he even gave us a layer of aishwarya 
he said, we're, we're ultimately we're worshiping Lakshmi Narayana. We, we have to start with that Shantarasa, right? That, that we, we reverence, we start with reverence. And once that is, once we're purified at the, at the, at the Shantabhava level um, of reverence, um, then that Lakshmi Narayana will move toward uh, Rad, Radha Krishna, the Madhurya. So Aishwarya moves into the Madhurya. Okay. But, but the fact remains that when you go to every temple, there is the embodiment of the Madhurya, of the ultimate embodiment of Madhurya, of Radha Krishna. That's the fact. Hmm. When, when strangers come to the temple, who is that boy and who is that girl? Or who is that man, who is that woman? Why are they standing together? Who are they? Hmm. I mean, you know, how do we explain that? So even that is difficult to explain. So the same challenges for explaining Radha and Krishna is the same kind of challenge that we will have in explaining the Rasa Panchadyayi. But this is our ultimate focus. As Christians have the crucifixion and the, the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus as their ultimate focus. Hmm. So we should not shy away from it, but we should learn about it, perhaps not be able to embrace it fully for a long time, but to move, to move ever closer and closer to it. True. So now, so if if we consider for the main obstacle in appreciating the Rasila is the moral or the ethical aspect of it. Hmm? Yes. So so this brings to two things, two questions. Even Parikshit Maharaj also expresses that apprehension. And yeah. uh, Shukdev Goswami addresses that in, in his own way over there. So when the Rasila is... Uh, so, so you talk about Sahajiyas. So, sahaj, so sahajiya and tantra are they technical are they the main you could say main causes of the misunderstanding or uh, imitation of the raslila within the indian tradition means we could say the west if people they may not know we want these terms but they may equate this as mundane but within the tradition were these the main reasons why the raslila started getting misunderstood yeah, if if it's not the main, it certainly is a very, you know, significant primary way uh, that it's been misunderstood. And as you indicated earlier, uh, Chaitanya Charanji, correctly, that you know, prior to the the British, you know, the pr prior to colonialism, uh, you know, the the tradition never had a second thought about it, really. Um, and of course, uh, in in the context of of Muslim uh, Muslim rule, um, again, uh, there would be uh, uh, opportunities to 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 feel a little self conscious about one's tradition, um, uh, because uh, you know, in in the encounter with other traditions, one has to look back at one's own tradition in a way that one can explain it and, and help others outside the tradition understand it and appreciate it. Now, in the world today, oh my gosh, we've got the encounter of different religious traditions like never before. Just even in New York City, I mean, you know, you've got everything there. Or in Mumbai, you've got everything there because of the nature of how the world has shrunk because of communications, and transportation, etc. So, it more than ever it behooves us to explain what our tradition's about. Even when we're on the street, we may be confronted in distributing a book. So, what is this Radha Krishna that we we see? You know, uh, who who is this couple? You know, 
So mm. again, uh, I think we have to, uh, and, and every age, you know, every generation has to find new ways of explaining and appreciating what the tradition gives us, the gifts of the tradition. So this is, this is of course, where brilliant, you know, uh, uh, homiletic thought has to come into play. This is where devotees who are really fine, sensitive teachers of Krishna Bhakti, it they will have to find the ways and the means to convey the beauty and the sublimity and the extraordinary heights of our tradition. Hmm. So this is what we're about. We're about helping people understanding to, to understand that this is a tradition focused on divine love, period. We are a tradition that worships love itself, the love between the divine feminine and the divine masculine, the supreme divine feminine and the supreme divine masculine. We worship their love at the most intimate and ultimate part of the Godhead and how that worship of love purifies us and turns us into extraordinary, extraordinary loving humans. Beautiful. And what, what and, and what else does the world need right now, Chaitanya Charanji? The, the world does not have enough of that stuff. Definitely. Yeah. So, so what would be how do we go about doing this? You know, one metaphor I sometimes use for explaining this whole idea of transcendental is that I take the Bhagavad Gita's concept of the reflection. The material world is like a reflection of the uh, spiritual world. So the male-female or the sensual relationships which often go towards the immoral, they are like the reflection. And the Gita and the Prasla describes the pure, the original relationship. That is the reality. So, in that sense, that verse, Vikriditam Rajavadhuviridam Chavishno, it means the more one actually gets to the real reality, once one gets to the real mango, one has no fascination for the reflected mango, for, for the reflection of the mango rather. So, so that this is this is the you could say the original pure. A pure love and I, I don't want to dismiss worldly love by saying that it is merely a reflection but there are different metaphors for using that so so that is one one way I, I use to explain that yes how actually rearing the Rastala can bring about uh, the awakening of real real or pure love but uh, what uh, so what do you think about this metaphor and what are the ways in which we can make the Rastala's uh, you could say transmoral dimensions more understandable. Yes. Okay. Using now, Prabhupada spoke about how this world is a distorted reflection of the ultimate world, the spiritual world. Yes. But we have to be careful in applying that. Let me go to something simple. Someone once asked me in a Sunday feast lecture, why is Krishna blue? And I said, let me help you with your question. Before I respond. <laughs> question. Okay. Okay. When you ask me, why is Krishna blue? You are assuming that this color blue is within the mundane color spectrum. Okay. So you're asking me a question that's filled with assumptions. Okay. So the color blue in this, if you go to a hardware store that sells paints, you wouldn't believe all of the range of blues that you can have unbelievable maybe 30 40 50 different shades and qualities of blue 
variations of blue. But even so, all those blues are but a fraction of the spiritual blue. The blue of this world is metonymically related to the spiritual blue. A metonym is when something participates in something greater, but only communicates a fraction of what that is. So for example, if I say, what goes on in the White House, you know, no, the White House, uh, uh, you know, is, is uh, planning such and such. Well, in America, we know that the White House is the, uh, uh, where the executive branch of government resides. But when we say literally a White House, no house can plan anything. It's 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 not sentient. It's a it's a it's dull matter. I mean, you know, the wall behind me. I mean, this is dull matter. No no house plans anything. So, White House is a metonym for the executive branch of government. So, in the same way, blue is a metonym for the extraordinary blue mm. that it's Krishna's divine color. So in, this, in the same way, romantic love in this world, the, the ability for two humans to lovingly come together in a, in a, in a, in a, more pure way rather than a degraded way. I'm not talking about the degraded relationships of this world, but the fact that the romantic, the capacity of human beings to come into this world and be terribly loving with one another, even animals have that uh, love uh, capacity with one another uh, because love is ubiquitous. But that's a metonym for the ultimate love that exists between the divine supreme figures of Radha and Krishna. Love is everywhere and it originates with Krishna. As Prabhupada used to love to uh, quote, Anandamayo Bhyasat. The supreme joy originates in the heart of the divine and can even come down into this world in a little bit. So it's a metonym. So right now I'm feeling very joyful speaking to you, Chaitanya Charan. Okay, I always have experienced lots of pleasure speaking to you. But that pleasure is a metonym for the kind of pleasure that is experienced in the divine. Metonym, not metaphor. Metonym. Yes, bro. I had heard this I, when I studied literary devices. I yes. heard about metonyms, but it is first time I think in one of your classes I read this. Uh, this it's quite a striking description. So we could put it metonym, and I explain it to to devotees. I have spoken it a few times in my classes that. So what is described is real, but the reality is more than what is described. It's right. more real than the real. That's right. Yeah. More real than the real. That's beautiful. That's right. Far more real than the real. So, so, so when I give the example of a, of a reflection and reality, I say real mango, reflected mango. So what you, what I mind, what you understand is that the way you nuance that example or qualified it is that even the love in this world is real, but it is, you could say like a fraction or a spark or a drop. So that At best. Yeah. At best. At best, huh? That's right. Okay. True. Because Prabhupada, look, I mean, the whole, that whole, uh, uh, you know, sort of controversial statement that Prabhupada makes that the women like men who are expert at rape, Prabhupada is talking about the darkest, lowest dimension of male-female relationships. He's making, he, 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 he depicts men as ra rapists, either good ones, expert ones, or bad rapists. They're bad at raping. Oh, God. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, and women who are sick enough 
to seek a man who is good at raping. Now, some, you know, it's unfortunate the way people have taken, the way devotees have taken this, because devotee women will somehow be trying to think, well, maybe I really do somewhere inside of me, you know, long for that or no, no. Healthy women do not seek men who are expert at rape. Now, men will sometimes interpret that or women also as men who are, you know, uh, shall we say, uh, 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 a little uh, forward and courting. But no, courting and courting and raping are two different things. Very different. Okay. Very different. Okay. So, you know, there's Tom, uh, Thomas Aguna. Thomas Aguna. Okay. And and uh, uh, where things are very dark and they're they're sick and Prabhupada speaks in the purport prior to it that sex addictions addictions are a very sick level of being a human addiction means I will do anything to serve that addiction I will use you I will use this one I will use that one and I don't care about anything but that addiction I must serve it like an alcoholic I must buy the alcohol I must get the alcohol or drugs. And addiction is a very, very degraded level of human existence. It's sick. And then people need help. Mm. There, there is sattvika love in this world. There are fine, beautiful relationships in this world. The, 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 even the Rasa Panchadhyayi explains that in this world, there can be very pure, uh, selfless relationships of love between a mother or parents and a child doesn't mean that all parents are sattvika. Their parents, they're horrible. Their parents that are kind of like, okay, kind of mixed, Raja Saguna. And then their parents that are really very good natured, really good, loving parents, sattvika. None of them are absolutely pure, but they reflect greater levels of love and lesser levels of love in even the perverse, the pervertedness of love. Okay. So okay. the Ras Lila is a depiction of the purest and most intense level of love, which is a metonym of romantic love, because even in this world, it's considered the most intense form of love. Beautiful. So it's, it's uh, so it's like a you could say a progression rather yes. than rejection of this to get there. Black and white, no. Okay. No black and white, no binary stuff. It's levels. Uh, we have this in the, the trigunya. As soon as you say there are rapists and design the horrible, you know, uh, you know, way men and women treat each other in pornography and all this kind of stuff. Ugly, ugly, degraded stuff. Well, you know, that's here in this world, okay? Um, but there are also beautiful relationships in this world, sweet relationships. Prabhupada once had, uh, was in, an, I think, in an airport, and there were two kittens playing lovingly with each other at his feet, I think, <laughs> near his feet, you know? And he said, just see, just see, there's love everywhere. Hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So love is ubiquitous. Bro, just a minute. Where is this pastime? You have a, a record of this pastime? Because I know the opposite. I think when Prabhupada came to the flat of, was it Michael Grant or somewhere he came? Or Carl Epstein in the early days and he had a pet cat. And that cat left on Prabhupada and Prabhupada pushed her away. <laughs> yeah. So, so generally, yeah. that is the first time which was often quoted that Prabhupada was not very appreciative of pets. But, no, he uh, did. Yeah, no, he wouldn't want a personal relationship with a pet, but he could perceive, of course, and frankly, as anyone can perceive, pictures, you know, the way cats can be or, or dogs or, you know, are, are they're not uh, working from a, this primal procreative level, but rather they're just affectionate all throughout Chaitanya Leela. How many times is Chaitanya embracing devotees, hugging devotees? Even Sanatana Goswami had sores all over his body, right? 
He said, don't get near me. Don't, don't get near me. I don't want you. <laughs> and Mahaprabhu Garanga ignored him because love is higher than the body. Hmm. All bodies have sores. Every, everyone is Sanatana Goswami in terms of the bodily sores. Do you know how much bacteria every body carries? Beautifully put on. Hundreds of trillions of bacteria are carried on the body, even more than the number of cells we have in the body. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the fact is we carry hundreds of trillions of bacteria. Mm. So, you know, don't don't hug me. You know, next time you see me, Chaitanya Charanji, don't hug me. Okay? I am a miserably contaminated being. Bodily, yes. But all of that is overlooked in the transcendental sense. And we embrace one another as bhaktas because we love each other. Hmm. True. So, so the Rasa Panchadyayi is a way for divinity to embrace the universe. Oh, beautiful. You know, first I heard the word as erase the universe. Then I started like, okay, embrace the universe. Yeah, so, embrace the universe. Yeah. To em look, look, a circle invites everyone outside of the circle. And everyone... And the circle has an inside that is very private and intimate. So on the one hand, a circle, you know, the, the, the convexity of a circle opens itself up to everybody universally. And the concavity of the circle, the inner part of the circle, is the private part. So it's the most intimate part. And yet it's also the most externally inviting, unlimitedly, infinitely inviting. Whereas the circle itself is closed, but yet the outside of the circle is open unlimitedly and infinitely to all souls. And when Krishna plays his flute, he's inviting everyone to the dance. Prabhupada says, everyone is welcome to the dance. Mm. So... This is beautiful. I'm just thinking in terms of, uh, so how does one enter into that embrace? How does one, everybody's invited, but what does one do to actually enter that embrace? The Shravanam process is the key to entering the dance. Okay. By hearing this Rasa Panchadyayi, but also hearing all of the Bhagavata, we become purified to where we can hear the Rasa Panchadyayi properly. This is why Prabhupada says, begin at the first canto, then climb up to the second canto, then the third, then the fourth, then the fifth, and, and so on. And we also uh, worship the deity that way. We start at the feet, and then we rise upward in puja. So the idea here is that Prabhupada is preparing us for the dance. Even if you don't know how to dance, believe me, when your heart is filled with prema, you will know how to dance. Beautiful. It is beautiful stuff. It is the essence of our tradition. This is what we're all about. We just... Here, I've got, um, let me see here. Uh, let's see, Harvest of the Heart. What did I do here? I think I quote Prabhupada. I think I quote Prabhupada here. I wanted to read these beautiful quotes. Um, the intelligence is that we should again go back to home, back to Krishna, and dance with him in his rasa dance. Now, 
Is anything clearer than that, uh, Chaitanya Chari? I'll read that again. The intelligence is that we should, go, should again go back to home, go back to Krishna and dance with him in his rasa dance. This is Mumbai, December 28th, 1974, Sriman Bhagavatam class. Third Canto 26, chapter 19th verse. Okay, if that's not quite clear, let me uh, read this to you. You have to go back to home, go back to Krishna, and there is your real life. Krishna comes, therefore. He, dis he displays his rasa dance in Vrindavan to attract these fallen souls, that if you want enjoyment, why not come back to me? Hmm. Here is the enjoyment. Here is the enjoyment, eternal enjoyment, enjoyment, varieties of enjoyment. Hyderabad, April 23rd, 1974. If that's not good enough for you, listen to this one. Those who have got little brain, they are satisfied with temporary, and those who are advanced, yogis, they are not satisfied with temporary happiness. They must be seeking for unlimited happiness. They can be achieved, that can be achieved when you go back to home, back to Krishna. Krishna is eternal. His pastimes are eternal. Just join with Krishna, his rasa dance, his play with cowherd boys, his dealing with father, his father and mother in Vrindavan. Hmm. So our, this movement is to join Krishna's pastimes. Arrival lecture, Los Angeles, 1973. How do you like these quotes? This is beautiful, Prabhu. So overall, uh, what uh, we are getting over here is that uh, the, you, the Shravanam is like the doorway to enter into the whole world of love. And uh, that world of love is, it doesn't so much involve rejection of the existing, but it is more like addition to the existing. Yes. Or a building up on the existing, isn't it? Yes. Mm. But somehow, exactly. uh, and this, this may be not directly related a question, but somehow for many years, the perception that I had got based on, say, some of some purports of Shri Prabhupada and other things like that, that um, the worldly love is simply a source of attachment and illusion, and one has to give that up if you want to grow in bhakti. So it seems that that is one aspect of it, but that is not the only aspect of it. Right. It's we could say even when we talk about worldly love, it could be in goodness, passion, ignorance also. And like you give the example of uh, male-female interactions being in, like rape being would be like a dark tamoguna. Right. And it's not that healthy people will like that. So it seems this nuance of, uh, so we could say, that going back to your early example of, uh, say, love in, the world, love in this world being like a drop of the love in the spiritual world. So we could say that... Um, it's a it's a like a significant drop when it is in goodness and yes. it is ignorance we could say it's a very small drop or we could say it's like a a the drop which is somewhat poisoned also yeah you know, very poisoned if it's in Thomas of Guna, yes mm. but still it's it's a progression it's a continuity right see Prabhupada says that prema is dormant hmm. So if it even awakens a little bit and is mixed with other kinds of love, it's like oil and water. Oil is thick and does not mix with water. But water is pure. And if there's a, even a little bit of water next to the oil, then, you know, sometimes um, love in this world can be, even at, at its best, um, it can be selfish. It can be self-serving. Mm. It can be egoistic. But it can also be extraordinarily caring, sacrificing, um, compassionate, kind, sensitive. Mm. Yes. 
But we've seen people like that too. This is not counterintuitive. So love is there. It's just not there in perfection. True. Makes sense. Yeah. It lies dormant within the heart of all living beings. You know, I, I, I once wrote a, uh, uh, did a presentation in Chennai in an academic conference. And the title of my paper was uh, The Ubiquity and Scarcity of Prema. Prema, on the on one hand, is everywhere, according to the Bhagavata. And yet, it's there's a scarcity of prema because it's only, by our tradition, it's held as the highest attainable state in the fullness of the devotional heart. So it's rarely attained. And yet, prema is also everywhere. Mm. And I go to the Bhagavata and show that prema can take place not just between a human and the divine and a, and a divine personage and another divine personage, but apparently prema can take place between a human and another human, and even a human and an animal, and even between an animal and another animal, and even between an, a, a human and a cloud. I did all this research in the uh, in the Bhagavata to show the word prema and derivative uh, words uh, from uh, the, the verb root from which prema comes. It's used all over the place in all kinds of relationships. But what the Goswami teachers in our tradition have determined is that prema in its fully blossomed and highest state is only available through Krishna Bhakti. Mm. So, so overall, what you're saying is that it is important for us to hear the Raspila to actually be able to uh, develop that prema. So what about some devotees who feel that still the Ras that I read instructions of Prabhupada also, if you read it and you feel agitated, don't read it right now. And you also mentioned it, till you are ready. So does one need to hear the Raspila or to develop that, to open the doors to love or even Krishna childhood pastimes and uh, other pastimes can also be heard yes. to, to develop that love. How, how essential, because the Rasdila has so much potential to be misunderstood. So how, why is it, is it necessary or can we nourish our pure love simply by other, other pastimes involving pure love also? Yes. Um, I would say yes to both. I mean, the ultimate Leela is the Ras Leela in the sense that all the, the effect of all other Leelas, the essence of all other Leelas are there in the Rasa. The Rasa is the sum total of Rasa. Remember the difference, right? Rasa is the sum total of all Rasa. So this is the ultimate vision. Now, you know what I came to in the conclusion in this book that was published by Princeton University Press, very prestigious publisher. Mm. You couldn't get higher, okay? The conclusion is that the Maha Mantra, the vocative case in which these names of divinity, feminine and masculine, the pattern, the, circu the circuitous, pattern of the divine feminine divine masculine names the kind of dance pattern between single uh, 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 recitation of the name dual recitation of the names you know, single dual and so on my conclusion is that the maha mantra is the sonic replication of the rasa mandala when we ultimately chant the Maha Mantra, we are replicating the dance around our hearts. We have the opportunity to enter the dance when we chant the Maha Mantra. Because we are recreating the Ras Mandala in these the circuitous divine names. But chanting, of course, begins in a rudimentary way. 
right? At the Kanishta level, it's it's something we just, it's a discipline. Hmm. Vaidhi Bhakti. What else is Vaidhi Bhakti? That's it. That means it's a discipline. It's a worthy discipline, but it's a discipline. Okay. So if you're if you're uh, uh, practicing piano and you want to be a concert uh, you know musician at the piano, then you you practice scales. The same the same keyboard that's used for da 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 right. The same keyboard that's used for that is used for performing you know Johannes uh, you know. Bach in, or 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 uh, Brahms or or Beethoven, same keyboard. Hmm. But first you practice scales, and then after you've gone through the disciplines, um, the 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 ascetic, the ascetical disciplines of Japa, of Japa Dhyana, then it moves and grows into something very relishable. But what are we doing when we're chanting the Maha Mantra? We are calling out for Radha and Krishna. Why are we calling out for them? Mm. We're calling out for them because we want to be closer to them. And we want to celebrate them. Both celebration of them honors the presence of Radha and Krishna in our lives. Calling out for them celebrates that longing and viraha the desire to be closer, samapati, closerness. Mm. This is love. This is love. And in love, we can never be close enough to the beloved. You and I will never feel close enough to Radha and Krishna's love. It's insatiable in a divine kind of way. Mm. When Krishna plays his flute, he is calling all of us. Chanting the Maha Mantra is the response to the sound of Krishna's flute. This is why we chant the Kama Gayatri. The seventh line is to hear the sound of Krishna's flute. The Maha Mantra is epiphenomenal because it is a response to the divine love that is eternally there. But we have yet to, so it, it's sort of like someone calling you on your phone and you never answer. Krishna's been calling us for an eternity and we just don't answer. And how rude is that? You know, uh, uh, if I keep calling you or keep e emailing you, Chaitanya Charan, and you never answer, you know what I'm going to say? Well, he's rude. True. <laughs> but Krishna is more compassionate than I am. Krishna says, they're not rude. They are distracted. They are embroiled in the phenomenal world. They're caught up. But I will keep calling them forever until they respond. You and I are very fortunate, Chaitanya Charan. Prabhupada has taught us how to respond to his calling. That is the Maha Mantra. And ultimately, when we return the call, the divine love call of Krishna, we learn that Krishna is actually calling us to his dance. And then the Maha Mantra is the reflection and embodiment, the sonic embodiment of that Rasa dance, that Ras Mandala. I know there's a lot of heavy stuff I'm throwing at you. <laughs> I would say it's heavy. It's rich. It's rich. That's right. That's right. It's rich and it's beautiful. This is the essence of our tradition. This is the essence. You know, devotees want to get distracted by, you know, reading the Goswami's works. And we've got devotees. One devotee is translating like a machine, you know, uh, you know, all these endless works that are written by devotees and great, wonderful devotees of the past. No, we've got everything here. We don't need to, it's funny because our own tradition can be a distraction from our own tradition. Don't get caught up. Absorb yourself in chanting. Don't feel like you have to read everything that this one 
leading devotee translates forever. He just keeps, you know, and the quality is like, okay, you know, uh, he, the point is this, that these can be a distraction. Um, uh, they, they say, you know, read the nectar. Now we're producing the nectar of our tree. No, the nectar is already here. Prabhupada has already given us the nectar. The Bhagavad Gita is an endless depth of nectar. Do you know how many times I've read the Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Sharanji? Thousands of times. Thousands. Thousands. Because I've had to translate it for publication. I've had to contemplate every verse over and over and over and over. It took me four years to contemplate each one of the verses of the Gita. Mm. And of course, I've been practicing for 55 years. 50 of those are as a disciple of Prabhupada. But I've been reading the Gita since I was a young teen. It's endless. And I and just the other day, Chaitanya Charanji, I was really I was realizing something fresh and anew in the Bhagavad Gita. You see, we have to be careful not to to read endless literatures, you know, mm. superficially, always staying, you know, on a superficial level, but de delving into the literature that Prabhupada gave us. Mm. He gave us everything we need, Chaitanya Charanji. This is beautiful. We do not have to go outside anywhere else. So, in one sense, you could talk about there is you can have breadth, and we can have depth. Yes, beautiful. So, Thank you. So, Thank you for that. So, breadth is breadth has its utility, but breadth should not come at the cost of the depth. And That's right. If you want to get the depth, uh, it is it is it is available. We don't need something new. Yeah, mm -hmm. I. I, and in one sense, also, I love the way you explained this, that, that our tradition can come in the way of, our, can be a distraction from our tradition. That's and, right. <laughs> it's very... I know, it's ironic. It's ironic. Yeah. The tradition can be a distraction from the tradition. Yeah, it's so true. It is like, uh, the tradition contains so many things, and whether, so whether those things are helping us fulfill the core purpose of the tradition that is something which is so central to discuss yes so yes and so so you know what chaitanya charanji devotees can ask themselves am i distracting myself from the very beautiful gifts that prabhupada has given me by reading these other texts and other translations and whatnot am i one has to get honest with oneself. Am I delving into the gifts that Prabhupada gave me more, perhaps with the aid of some other books? Okay, fine. But the point is this, that if it doesn't help us delve more deeply into what Prabhupada gave us and the true nectar that Prabhupada gave us, then it is a distraction from the tradition that we are participants, in which we are participants. And this can be a terrible uh, kind of um, a diversion, distraction. Mm, I think this also uh, harkens back to, sorry, to your earlier no. point that you said that uh, the safeguard is hearing from the right person or right, right source. Now, right yeah. source doesn't necessarily only mean that it's in the tradition. It's also within the tradition, somebody who knows our level and helps us rise from our level. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And this is the value of Guru. This is the whole point of Guru. If we're not reading these other uh, pieces of literature under the guidance of Guru, then this is dangerous. Hmm. So one has to take the guidance. Now, uh, when I say Guru, I don't necessarily mean one person. True. It depends on how Guru manifests in your life. Guru manifests as a in the, in the Kanishta level in a certain way, in the Majima level in a in a in a in a broader way, and Guru at the Uttama level is 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 very broad and complete. So Guru, how we how we read, how we embrace the gifts that Prabhupada gave us, is about our relationship 
with Prabhupada, with Prabhupada himself and his Bani. So we, so, you know, it, it's, it's going to other pieces of literature should at best be only supplementary and there should be a reason uh, born out of seva. Born out of seva. There's a, there should be a serve grounded in seva. One seva, one's, one's, one's kind of uh, bhajan and seva. So uh, if it is not, then it is a distraction from our own tradition. It is the tradition distracting us from our tradition. And we are the cause of that. Beautiful. That's true. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you see, Chaitanya Charanji, all kinds of points come out when we talk, right? Sure. You know, right. I'm just thinking one, one transition here. Yeah. To, should we do an, another podcast where we actually enter into the Ras Lila and discuss the specifics? Because oh, yes. I mean, it's endless. I mean, why do you think I wrote a 450 page book? Mm. Well, you know, the story behind that is. So when you when a, a doctoral um, candidate is asked to write a dissertation, you know, they're given some rules, at least at Harvard, you're given rules. So they told me you can only write 300 pages. Whoa, only write 300. I've never written 300 pages in my life. So I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to write 300 pages of, on the Ras Lila? How am I going to do that? So as I was getting into it, and I was reading into the commentaries of the Goswamis, the, the significant Acharyas, when, by the way, there were no translations available, so I had to read in the originals, and it was kind of annoying. I had a book that had the original um, uh, texts of, of the Acharyas, like uh, Baladi Vidyabhushana, Vishwanatha Chakravarti, Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami, um, Sridhar Swami, um, but it was in, in Bangla script. It was Sanskrit, but in Bangla script. Very annoying. But anyway, I had to, that's what I had to deal with. Okay, so, so I'm struggling through this. Anyway, what I found was, oh my gosh, there's no way I can limit all of this to just 300 pages. So I had to make a petition to the uh, Committee on Advanced Degrees at Harvard to be able to go 150 pages over the 300 word limit, a 300 page limit. And they granted that to me. But when I finally got done with the book, here it is. Look how fat this is. It's like a ream of paper, right? <laughs> yeah, true. So, when I finally got done, it came to 550 pages, but I never got permission to go 100 pages over the 450 pages. They could have thrown me out of the final defense because I went over. So I'm going to make a confession here to you, Chaitanya Charanji, because you're my friend. You're not going to report me to the Harvard authorities. I conveniently forgot to put the page numbers in the <laughs> in the pack for the bibliography and for the various appendices. I didn't put the page numbers. So they couldn't actually see how many pages I went over. And that's how I got through the defense. So you can see how thick the thing is, just, you know, just, I mean, endless, you know, anyway. Writing a dissertation is never easy. Writing a dissertation on the highest vision in Krishna Bhakti. I did a lot of praying, okay? I'll just put it that way. It's beautiful, Prabhu. Uh -huh. It's uh, I accidentally on purpose forgot to paginate the appendices of the bibliography so I could get out of Harvard. <laughs> and then you know what happened? Uh, yeah, the 550 pages kept going. I then had almost 3,000 pages. 
And the Princeton editor said, we're not going to publish your 2,800 pages, but we will publish your 800 pages. So you're going to have to figure out what are the most valuable treasures mm -hmm. to present in 800 pages, which turns into a 450 page book. Oh, so you can see, I went through quite a lot. <laughs> and it's a period of 10 years to write the one book. 10 years. Amazing. Okay. So it was quite a journey and it's now going to be an abridged version of this will be published by Oxford University Press, New York, uh, under a new title. And uh, it will be abridged and it will be called The Yoga of Love, Sacred Bhakti Poetry from the Ras Bhagwat's Ras Lila of Krishna. And basically my claim is that the ultimate yoga is the Ras Mandala. There is no higher yoga. Rasotsava Sampravritta Gopi Mandala Manditaha Rasotsava the rasa, the blossoming, the opening of the petals of the rasa, the celebration or festival of the rasa, rasotsava, right? Utsava, right? Rasotsava, sampravritta, the completely perfect moving or turning of the mandala, sampravritta. The Yoga Sutra talks about the, you know, um, uh, yoga chitta vritti narodaha, the perfect vritti, the perfect turnings of consciousness is the sampravritta of the ras mandala. Gopi mandala manditaha, a, a, a circle, a mandala decorated in the most beautiful way of gopis, raja gopikas. Amazing. The ultimate turnings of consciousness and awareness, the ultimate turnings within our whole hearts is the Ras Mandala. So here, are we using the word Ras Mandala in a metonymical way or in what sense are you saying ultimate turning of the, or are you saying that the ultimate expression of love is found in those pastimes or in what sense? Yes. It's beautiful, it's poetic, but I'm just trying to understand what how, what it would mean. It's both. It, it, there are so many levels to this. There is a literal circle of Rajagopikas. Hmm. And the circuitous motion of this actually it, it conveys the shape of consciousness as chitta vritti. The vritti means the turnings of awareness or consciousness or the turnings within the whole heart. And those turnings are ultimately, you know, either mundane and totally conditioned by our, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the stuff in our minds, or they're purely uh, conditioned or they're purely um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, how would you say, uh, they take the pure form of turnings within consciousness and the ultimate focal point of pure consciousness is the Ras Mandala because it itself turns. That's a turning. That's the, the ultimate meditation. So in this, in this depiction of the Ras Mandala, our meditation is, is like a yantra. We're supposed to meditate on this circle. Hmm. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And it keeps going and going and going and going. The Maha Mantra dances forever within our hearts. I That's perfection. Chaitanya Charanji. I don't know of any other perfection. Beautiful. So, 
So in one sense, the Ras Lila, we could say, like we talk about in Bhakti, the means and the ends are the same. Yes. So we could say chanting is, we could say chanting is the means to enter into the Ras Lila, but chanting is also a part of being in the Ras Lila itself. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So it's only a matter of, uh, we could say, realization. Exactly. Just like the keyboard of a piano. You can play chopsticks or something stupid and silly and whatever, but you can play some of the most magnificent music ever. Mm. And speaking of music, as I explained in the book, all the ragas, all the music in the universe originates in the Ras Mandala, in the Rasa dance. Is this in a historical sense or a philosophical sense? Yes. And transcendental sense. We'll add a third. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. It's all there. The singing and the dancing. Um, the singing of the Vraja Gopikas was beautiful. And they sang in, in perfect, uh, the perfect ragas, the essence of all ragas. And the musical instruments were supplied by the celestials and their vimanas who were gazing down upon this beauteous scene as well as they were throwing flowers down. And the, the rhythm, the percussion was there by the dancing uh, um, uh, bodies of the Rajagopikas because, because they wore uh, uh, bells on their belts and, and ankle bells. And they would, um, they would uh, express a, a rhythm uh, so that was the percussion, and there were drums also with the uh, in the vimanas with the celestial beings, um, and so they participated and supplied some of the the instrumentation. Hmm. So music was a very important part because, after all, what do you dance to? You dance to music. But the reason I titled this book "Dance of Divine Love" is because love itself is a dance between the divine personages and souls and the divine personages. It's a dance. It goes back and forth. Amazing. Yep. It's endless stuff to talk about. I mean, my gosh. I, I mean, you know, I it, it took me 10 years to write this book. I, I wrote close to 3,000 pages about the Rasa Panchadhyayi and whittled it down to 800 page of manuscript. <coughs> Excuse me. And so there, there's a lot to talk about. So true. It's true. I, you know, I really look forward to maybe another podcast because it will take some time. Yes. So <clears throat> we can actually go into the last line. We can go maybe chapter by chapter or section by section and look at oh, it yes. some sections. Yes. And, uh, Today it may not be possible. I think you also no. have time constraints. So <laughs> yes. can I try to summarize and then maybe we can add some concluding words? Beautiful. Please. Yeah. So <clears throat> the topic we discussed was uh, should when should we uh, or should we not study the Ras Leela? And broadly discussed, say, three things. One is the why is the Ras Leela, why is there apprehension in studying the Ras Leela? Why is it important and how can we access it? So the apprehension is because at one level, at the time of Prabhupada and the Acharyas before him, Tantra and Sahajya aspects of the Rasli, those aspects had contaminated the understanding of the Rasli and it was seen as immoral even in India. Where it was not, in the before that, it was not seen like that. It was seen as transcendental and it didn't make people imitate. And then Prabhupada went to the West, there was the whole free sex culture so Prabhupada was extremely cautious in not letting devotees or new people find some spiritual rationalization for continuing the, continuing the previous ways of living. But at the same time, while Prabhupada was cautious, he didn't succumb to excessive caution, as you put it, that he gave the Ras Dila in the, uh, in the Ras Panchadhyay and his Krishna book itself, and which were meant to be widely distributed. So, and it, that beautifully you translated that Ras Panchad, their concluding verse. So that itself says that while it actually hearing it can 
free us from lust so so it's a, so there is a context where it can be misunderstood and that's why we need to be we could say we need to be ready to hear it it doesn't mean that we should never hear it so then right. why hear it why is it important because i like that very striking metaphor that this is as central to our tradition as jesus on the crucifix is to to the christian tradition and it may not be immediately there the violence may be off putting and here the sensual seeming sensuality may be off putting but um, we need to be able to say that the insider perspective and the outsider perspective so we need to be aware of how it is perceived in the outside and we need to be expert to uh, explain in a way that does misconceptions are avo- avoided and we ourselves need to also develop the insider perspective so that we can relish it and yes. ultimately the rasleela is a expression of uh, the purest form of love between the lord and his uh, and his the masculine and feminine manifestations yeah. so and then we talk about how all love is a progression yeah. so love in this world in sattva guna that is like a drop of the love that is there in the spiritual world between the divine couple and then there is there are more th- tamasic forms of love in prabhupad talks about certain things uh, a proper statements about rape so they are like a very very distorted it's a expression of poisonous poisons poisonous or poisoned expression of some kind of affection remote reflect remote distortion of affection so then we discuss that it is because it is the purest the highest form of love so it is important for us to appreciate it and relish it so in that connection talk about, earlier you start talk about how rasa, rasa and rasa there are two different things everybody has some rasa with someone you know say there is rasa even among animals and humans yes. and animals of different species and we talk about prabhupada also appreciated love between mm. animals so the rasa is actually the the rasa mandal the the circular formation which the the formation where the leela is performed and then it discussed how, how do we enter into that so because it is the highest manifestation of love it is important for us to move toward that and the way do we do we do it is the shravanam so shravanam has two aspects one is hearing the past times and understanding it from the right sources and the second is the chanting of the holy names so chanting is both a means by which we can enter the uh, the sacred past times of radha and krishna and it's also the uh, actually it is we are already entering into the past time it's a matter of realization and while hearing it's more important for us to have breadth uh, to depth than breadth and you talk elaborately about your your journey also i think that was a consistent strand strand of thought that uh, unified and you could say personalize this whole discussion that how you how you actually were told to almost to write on this to explore this particular past time and how although you have written one book you have so much more to share and i was delighted to know that another book going much more detailed into this past time is coming <laughs> forward to that so thank you very much was there anything you want to add or uh, to conclude that the uh, the 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 uh, maha mantra is but the sonic embodiment uh, of the ras mantra sonic embodiment it's, yes it's what we're doing it's it's what we're all about even if you don't feel it or experience it that is what we're doing we are replicating uh the ras mandala in the sound in the in, in the sounds of the maha mantra uh, we're celebrating the ras mandala this is the essence of our tradition so it really it's truly the essence beautiful yeah yeah thank you very much for we'll look forward to our next discussion on the ras lila in detail thank you always chaitanya charanji my pranams my pranams to you thank you <laughs>